Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's celebration of the International Day on, of Bi Biological Diversity. Uh, I'm very pleased um, to first of all thank, uh, first and foremost, our FAO liaison office in Geneva, especially the officer in charge, Ms. Sandra Viles and uh, Mr. Silvano uh, from the office, as well as their entire team who are here for having organized this event. Uh, I would also secondly like to welcome the chairman of the governing body of the International Treaty, Dr. Sabran, and uh, our moderator for today, Mrs. Claire Duhl, who is a former BBC correspondent and uh, communi communications consultant, and I would like to hand over to her. Thank you very much, Dr. Barty, and welcome indeed to the UN Palais des Nations and our celebration of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, a treaty that is really playing a key role in mainstreaming plant biodiversity. And I'm delighted to be joined today by international organization representatives non-governmental organization representatives, national agencies, representatives of indigenous populations who I think all understand the benefits of this treaty and how it can really sustain people and livelihoods. And of course, if we're going to meet the sustainable development goals, then this treaty is going to play a key role, particularly in ending hunger, combating poverty, and halting biodiversity loss. So without further ado, I would very much like now to introduce Dr. Ren Wang, Associate Director General of the FAO, who is going to talk to us on video. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry that I'm not able to be with you in person today. And it is my great pleasure to send a message instead to the event organized by the Secretariat of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture and the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva in recognition of the International Day for Biological Diversity 2016. The theme of this year, mainstreaming biodiversity, sustaining people and their livelihoods, confirms that biodiversity is the foundation for life and for the essential services provided by the ecosystems. Mainstreaming biodiversity in the development of different sectors in our life is essential to realizing sustainable development, which is a major goal of the international community and a global responsibility. Food production depends on biodiversity and the services provided by the ecosystems. In September last year, the international community endorsed the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, establishing the ambitious vision and the commitments necessary to secure the future of the world's food in the face of climate change. With SDGs, countries have made a comprehensive approach to food security and the way food is grown, produced, processed, and transported is the fundamental connection between people and the planet and the path to inclusive and economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to transform our current input-heavy food systems to make them more sustainable, including reducing food waste and loss, through better management and improved techniques in agriculture, livestock, fisheries, and forestry. FAO is committed to making agriculture, forestry, and fisheries more productive and sustainable, which is one of the FAO's five strategic objectives or strategic programs now, as implemented. We ensure that the increased productivity does not only benefit the few, and that the natural resources base can provide services such as pollination, nutrient cycling, 
in soils, quality water that enhance sustainability. Within the United Nations systems, FAO is taking a lead in the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal number two, which provides a comprehensive framework to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. SDG 2 contains concrete and challenging targets on the need to conserve, exchange, and invest in plant genetic resources to achieve global food security by the year 2030. FAO is honored to host and support the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, Food and Agriculture, which is the only binding international agreement specifically dealing with the sustainable management of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. The treaty addresses the important linkages of sustainable agricultural production and natural resource management in the context of climate change. By providing an international governance and architecture for agriculture and the environment, the treaty makes easier the exchange of seeds and the genetic diversity to improve the conservation and the sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture in a world where most countries heavily depend upon crops originating elsewhere. Adopting the treaty itself is a major commitment of the international community to preserve biodiversity. The treaty also recognizes the enormous contribution of farmers to the conservation and the development of the diversity of crops. Its benefit sharing fund has been supporting farmers in developing countries to conserve crop diversity in their fields and assisting farmers and breeders globally to adapt crops to the changing global environment. And further, as the technologies could make a very significant contribution to the conservation and the use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture in developing countries, identifying such technologies and promoting their transfer are also facilitated by the Benefit Sharing Fund in such a way relevant to the needs of poor rural communities. The partnership between the International Treaty and the Convention on Biological Diversity is a model of synergy and mutual supportiveness between relevant international instruments for the preservation of biological diversity in the world. And their close cooperation, in turn, contributes to strengthening the implementation of both legal instruments. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all fruitful discussion and a successful outcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ren Wang, FAO Assistant Director General. And I'd now like to give the floor to Dr. Sabran, who's the chairperson of the governing body of the International Treaty, who's going to talk about farmers' rights and benefit sharing. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Secretary of the Treaty, Dr. Bati. It's my great pleasure to be here today to celebrate the International Day of Biological, Biological Diversity 2016. And I wish to thank the uh, organizer of the meeting, uh, the Secretary of the Treaty and the uh, Evaluation Office in, in Geneva for excellent preparation of this uh, meeting in a short time. And many of you who are today who are here today have displayed your long-standing commitment to mark this special event. The International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resource for Food and Agriculture, or we call it the treaty, is a legally binding international framework for the conservation and sustainable use of these crucial resources, which are the very basis of world food security, as well as for the fair and equitable sharing of the benefit arising from their use. The robust multilateral system of the treaty, allowing for a fair and well-balanced sharing of the benefit arising from the use of these precious genetic resources. 
the, the benefit sharing fund of the treaty has funded several projects in the developing countries in the area of conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, which has high impacts on the ground. Three call proposals have been issued, and the fourth one is in preparation. The treaty recognizes the past, present, and future contributions of farmers in all regions of the world, particularly those in centers of origin and diversity, in conserving, improving, and making available these resources. It also affirms that the right to save, use, exchange, and sell farm seeds, farm sheep seeds, and other property material, and to participate in the decision making regarding and in their in fair and equitable sharing of the benefit arising from the use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture are fundamental to the realization of farmer rights as well as the promotion of farmer rights at national and international levels. The governing body has invited contracting parties and development corporations organizations to consider providing financial and technical support for the implementation of farmers' rights as set out in Article 9 of the treaty in developing countries and to enable farmers and representatives of farmers' organizations to attend meetings under the international treaty. It also requested the Secretary to report on a relevant discussion that relate to farmers' rights as set out in Article 9 of the International Treaty within the FAO Fora and encourage the Treaty, the Secretary, to conduct active outreach on the extent of farmers' rights as set out in Article 9 of the Treaty to relevant stakeholders as another necessary measure to advance the implementation of this right. As I have mentioned before, the main objective of the Treaty are the conservation and the sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefit of the benefit arising out of their use in harmony with the Convention of Biological Diversity for Sustainable Agriculture and Food Security. This objective will be attained by closely linking this treaty to food and agriculture organizations at the United Nations and to the Convention of Biological Diversity. The governing body of the treaty has requested the Secretariat to continue monitoring and participating in the relevant process related to the Convention of Bi on Biological Diversity and its Niagara Protocol, and in order to promote practical, harmonious, and appropriate interface among them, both nationally and internationally. It also called on contracting parties in view and adapting their national biodiversity strategy, strategy and action plan and implementation of the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020 and the IG biodiversity target to ensure that their commitment under the treaty are fully reflected, especially through enhanced improvement of all relevant stakeholders. It should be kept in mind the importance of maintaining the policy and relevance of the international treaty in relation to other international processes, and to consider means of elevating its profile in the international arena. One way to work toward this objective is by raising, by raising awareness and celebrating the treaty accomplishment. In this regard, I would like to acknowledge the capable and dedicated work of the Secretary of the Treaty under the leadership of Dr. Sakil Bati. In fact, this celebration is part of a list of events to raise awareness of the treaty work and in its anticipated work in coming years. Finally, I wish you have a successful, fruitful meeting I thank you for the, your attention and your participation in this event of this important milestone in life of the International Treaty. I also would like to announce that the government of Indonesia, together with Norway, will host the uh, second global consultation on farmers' rights in Bali uh, in September 27 to 31 this year. I hope and I, I, I expected some of you will be there to attend this consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabran. And we're now going to hear another video message. This is from the Executive Secretary of the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity, Dr. Braulio Ferreira de Souza Diaz. Dear colleagues, as we celebrate the International Day for Biological Diversity, 
I wish to congratulate and commend the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture for organizing this event as a contribution to mainstream biodiversity to sustain people and their livelihoods. The theme of today's event, I Have a Seed, is a very compelling message. Agriculture is one of the sectors being targeted for mainstream biodiversity at the 13th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. The CBD and the International Treaty recognize the enormous contribution that indigenous peoples and local communities and farmers of all regions of the world, particularly those in the centers of origin and crop diversity, have made and will continue to make for the conservation and development of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, which constitute the basis for food and agriculture production throughout the world. The CBD, its Nagoya Protocol, and the International Treaty share a common commitment to promote the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities and farmers' rights. At the upcoming 13th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the CBD, the parties will be considering guidelines on the development of mechanisms for obtaining prior informed consent of indigenous peoples and local communities for access to their knowledge, innovations, and practices for the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the use of such knowledge and for reporting and preventing unlawful appropriation of traditional knowledge. Once adopted, these guidelines should assist in ensuring that prior informed consent is obtained for access to traditional knowledge and that benefits arising from the use of such knowledge are shared. This complements the work being advanced under the International Treaty concerning the rights of small farmers and in situ conservation. The International Treaty, as well as the Convention on Biological Diversity and its Nagoya Protocol, also share the objective of access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their use. We are very pleased that the protocol has now received 75 ratifications and is on track for 100 uh, ratifications by the end of this year. Our two secretariats are working hand in hand to provide effective support to national policy makers to implement both agreements and to put in place the necessary measures to implement the protocol with assistance from the treaty. One recent example was a workshop that brought together teams of national policy actors from different ministries, including environment, agriculture, finance, and planning, to discuss and consider how to embed access and benefit sharing in broader national policy goals, such as science and research priorities, climate change adaptation, and poverty alleviation. It is these sorts of innovative approach that can contribute both to the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol and the International Treaty, and also to mainstream biodiversity into other sectors. As we celebrate the International Day for Biological Diversity, let us remember that all of us, from farmers, scientists, indigenous peoples, and local communities, as well as ordinary citizens and the business community, can make a difference in our actions and choices. Thank you. Thank you. And with no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Shakil Bharti, Secretary of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Thank you very much and good afternoon. The United Nations has proclaimed May the 22nd as the International Day for Biological Diversity to increase the understanding and awareness of biological diversity issues. And in 1992, the United Nations adopted the Convention on Biological Diversity as the overarching framework instrument uh, to safeguard biological diversity in all sectors. And you have just heard 
a address from the Executive Secretary of the CBD. The CBD is the sister convention of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, and we in the International Treaty focus in particular on agricultural plant biodiversity, and therefore also uh, the title that we have chosen for today's event, I Have a Seed, since the agricultural biodiversity that we uh, try to conserve and facilitate both the exchange and sustainable use of uh, is the diversity of seeds. Within the FAO uh, coordination and together with the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, the International Treaty has also actively engaged with the United Nations system-wide process for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we've been especially pleased that in the 2030 agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals, the uh, diversity of seeds has been given particular prominence, especially with uh, targets 15.6 um, of the new SDGs. And uh, as Secretary of the Treaty, uh, I've been working to arrange that the Treaty will contribute through the FAO coordination to the indicators uh, that will in the future provide concrete ways of measuring how uh, agricultural biodiversity and in particular uh, diversity of seeds is being conserved, uh, used and how benefits are also shared. The work of the Treaty contributes to the strategic framework of FAO by uh, focusing on the second objective, which is to increase and improve the provision of goods and services from agriculture uh, in a sustainable manner. And I would like to briefly uh, give you a short overview of six main stages in which the International Treaty responds to the challenge of providing new seeds that uh, can meet the challenges of climate change and increasing population growth. The first is on-farm conservation and management. Uh, here, the Leading the Field initiative of the treaty has been designed as a global initiative to help adapt the crucial genetic diversity that we need to adapt crop production uh, and consequently food production to climate change impact through a series of immediate impact projects which support uh, farmers uh, and other stakeholders in producing and conserving uh, plant genetic diversity. Through this initiative, so far, um, about 10.1 million farmers have been directly or indirectly reached. Um, more than 3,600 new plant varieties have been identified, characterized and evaluated for their tolerance to climate change stresses, both biotic and abiotic stresses. Second is the ex to conservation and availability of genetic resources. In this area, the Global Crop Diversity Trust is an essential element of the treaty's funding strategy and operates an endowment fund that provides stable financial support to international gene banks uh, and thereby helps to preserve uh, plant genetic diversity. Third is the facilitated exchange of plant genetic resources, uh, which is achieved by the treaty through the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing. Under this system, we have established a global gene pool which now includes more than 1.7 million samples of plant genetic materials. That means 1.7 million different varieties of seeds uh, that are exchanged under the treaty's uh, multilateral system. Today the system facilitates the transfer of about six to eight hundred accessions of such genetic material per day worldwide and uh, we are currently transfer, transferring about 480,000 accessions uh, every quarter. The fourth area is the information systems which describe this uh, genetic diversity. The treaty's global information system on plant genetic resources facilitates the exchange of scientific and technical information 
and environmental data relating to crop diversity that both enable the conservation and the enhanced sustainable use uh, of genetic diversity. This includes uh, genotypic sequencing data as well as phenotypic data and, um, as I mentioned, environmental data. Fifth is the stage of pre-breeding where the a treaty facilitates public-private partnerships uh, through uh, the, for the development of new seeds. And sixth is uh, the stage of new technologies where the treaty is supporting the development of an open platform for co-development and transfer of technology uh, that makes use of plant genetic resources and that enables the production of new uh, seeds and new plant varieties. I would also like to highlight in particular, as we will hear later today, uh, the role of farmers in the conservation of agricultural biodiversity. And uh, today's uh, event will have a focus on Article 9 of the treaty, which is on farmers' rights. And it is particularly opportune that this week there is a working group, I believe, meeting here in Geneva um, that is also discussing related issues. And we will come back to those later in the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barty. And indeed, we've heard about the importance of farmers and local communities in the conservation of plant genetic resources but also of indigenous communities, uh, which uh, leads me to introduce Mr. Lars Anders Baer, who's former president of the Sami parliament in Sweden and the president of the Sami parliamentary council. And I read in your biography that indeed your family was involved in traditional reindeer herding. So I think it's actually very apt that we have a wonderful video to show you, which is entitled Moving with the Reindeer in Winter. Oh, 
And I'd now like to give the floor to Lars Anders Baer, who will talk about the importance of protecting farmers' livelihoods and farmers' rights. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and the friends of indigenous people, you hopefully enjoyed the video ride from the Sami homelands up me, more known as Lapland. Um, and you may ask, uh, what has I, Snow and Raiding herding, raiding herding to do with the thematic of this event? I will leave that question open. Uh, first of all, I want to thank FAO for, for the invitation and the possibility to address some views uh, from an indigenous point of view uh, and highlight some of the critical challenges most of the indigenous face today. The indigenous peoples uh, are now in a glo globally in a, in a crossroad between a grim colonial past and a future where indigenous peoples are recognized as peoples equal with other peoples. The, the video that you just saw is shot uh, from a drone on the Norwegian side, close to North Cape. The video captures both the past, the present, and hopefully the future, if not uh, climate change comes between. You can also see that the traditional reindeer herders are high-tech, use high-tech as snowmobiles and drones. Uh, and, and in the reindeer herders view, world view, tradition are not the opposite of functional modernity. In this context, we have to bear in mind that the, the animal herding, pastoralism, is a subsistence strategy that practice, is practiced by peoples and population on a low producing ecosystem worldwide. It has been estimated that pastoralism uh, uh, practiced on 25% of the global, global land area, providing 10% of the world meat production. Increasingly, it is slowly vanishing due to the land pressure, ecological degradation and climate change particularly in the developing countries. In the contemporary international political discourse concerning the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, uh, paradigm shifts have taken place in the be beginning of the 21st century. The United Nations General Assembly adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in September 13, 2007. This uh, decision must be, dis be, be described as a, an, the absolute paradigm shift in the relation between indigenous peoples in the world and the United States nation and its member states. At the 2014 World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, the General Assembly requested the development of a system-wide action plan for a co coherent approach of achieving the ends of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. After consultation with the indigenous peoples, member states, and within the UN system, the Secretary General shared a finalized system-wide action plan with heads on, of United Systems Agency at the meeting uh, of the United Nations Chief Executive Board in November 2015, where he encouraged them to make concentrated efforts uh, to implement the plan. The United Nations system is already at work implementing the action plan, which have been partly introduced uh, to indigenous peoples and member states at the 15th session of the Permanent Forum uh, that is now taking place in, the New, York, in New York, at the, uh, just at this moment. In this context, it's in enjoyable to note that FAO have been proactive. In February 2015, FAO organized a technical meeting between indigenous peoples' representatives with the objective of discussing a joint work plan to implement, implement the, uh, the 2010 FAO policy, and indigenous, uh, the policy of indigenous peoples and tribal peoples. One of the points uh, uh, of the joint work plan is, to, is the identification of FAO and indigenous peoples focal points at the global, regional and the national level, with the main objective of facilitating interaction between indigenous peoples and FAO on a regular basis. Uh, to enable this interaction, it was agreed to establish an indigenous peoples caucus, among others, to follow up and monitoring the implementation of the joint working plan between FAO and the indigenous peoples. In closing, I want to return back to uh, what I started with, namely ice, snow and reindeer herding, and, and to that add climate change. The footprint of, uh, of climate change is indeed evident in many places in the world. For many indigenous peoples in the, in, at the globe, they are living in ecological niches, uh, niches voluntary or by other reasons, in Amazonas, in the Congo Basin, the Andean Highlands, Sub-Sahara, the Pacific and 
in the Arctic, and this is already a reality. This is special evident in the Arctic and the Pacific, where the melting of sea ice and glaciers in the Arctic is interconnected with the rise of the sea levels in the Pacific. This means literally that uh, the ice is melting under the feet of the Inuit hunters in, in, uh, in the Arctic at the same time as many indigenous peoples in the Pacific are preparing to leave their uh, uh, disappearing islands uh, forever. Finally, I want to emphasize that agriculture in a broad sense, including food security, indigenous food system, and pastoral laws should have a more de decisive role, not only in the debate on climate change, but also in the struggle to de reduce the level of emissions, both in the short and in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd very much like to give the floor now to Dr. Gigi Manikad, a senior program officer, Global Programs on Sustainable Livelihoods for Oxfam. And Dr. Manikad will talk about supporting farmers' livelihoods and biodiversity conservation. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Bhatti, Dr. Sabran, fellow uh, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here and to share our experiences on how the Benefit Sharing Fund supports farmers' livelihoods and biodiversity conservation. Um, as has already been mentioned, um, Leading the Field is an initiative uh, which was launched in 2009 to invest in high impact projects addressing food security, adaptation to climate change, and agricultural biodiversity through the management of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. It funds projects for smallholder farmers in developing countries with the priorities of sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, information exchange, technology transfer, and capacity building, and managing and conserving plant genetic resources on farm. Uh, in its third year cycle, uh, about $20 million have been invested in 61 projects in 55 developing countries. Um, it has reached over eight, about 800,000 farmers, established a number of uh, community seed banks. This is a big program involving uh, 200 partners in the execution of the project. And also very importantly, uh, women are directly involved in ensuring conservation and biodiversity-based livelihoods. Next, please. Um, the Benefit Sharing Fund and Oxfam has three common partners, and I would like to highlight how farmers' livelihoods has been supported through three common partners that we have. One is the Community, Te Community Technology Trust in Zimbabwe, the Southeast Asian Regional Institute in Southeast Asia, and Andes of the Potato Park in Peru. We are working under a program called Sowing Diversity Equals Harvesting Security. Our aim is to strengthen farmer seed systems, particularly on the rights, as well as the technical aspects of how they could secure food and nutrition security for climate change adaptation. It is a global program, but we are focusing on five core countries, which is Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, Peru, Zimbabwe. We are directly targeting 150,000 households, of which 50% are women. We work in very diverse agroecologies, from lowland paddy, paddy fields to high mountain altitude, up to 4,000 meters high, and semi-arid regions. And we work both in high and low potential areas because we want to um, show that farmer seed systems are important and do work in both high and low potential areas. Scaling up a, a program of this magnitude is quite complicated, so we work with 50 different partners and allies. We work with civil society organizations, uh, groups of indigenous peoples and smallholder farmers. We work with governments and national and international research institutes and the private sector. Our donors include the Dutch and the, the Swedish government, IFAD, and as I have mentioned, three of our partners have gotten uh, benefit sharing fund support. What we're trying to do in our program is to change the impact pathways from a cycle of disaster to 
a pathway where we could scale up innovation and mainstream, mainstream this. The impact of disaster starts with gross inequality and inappropriate agricultural policies where there are farmers only get inappropriate seeds that are not responsive to climate disasters. We see countries with chronic crop failures and chronic poverty. And we really would like to change this. We have, um, and I'm not yet finished. Yes. Um, we have um, pathways which include a participatory toolkit on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. This involves baseline and endline surveys. Uh, this involves uh, farmer field school curriculum for, that are crop specific. Our, our main vehicle are farmer field schools, which we've adopted from the FAO. And this is our main vehicle for scaling up, where we work with farmers for two or three seasons, and they are self-spreading, and we move on to the next farmer field schools. The access of farmers to plant genetic resources is very important, and we, we, both, uh, we work with both traditional varieties, but also uh, modern varieties from research organizations. Of course, this has to be responsive to climate change. This biodiversity is very important for farmers um, adaptation. They use a combination, for example, of uh, short and early duration varieties to capture er er erratic rainfall, for example. Policy influencing is very important and also incredibly important and should be mainstream in all these pathways is gender inclusion. Because for even, for example, many of the partic participatory tools tend to be gender blind. Next, please. Um, in Zimbabwe, we try to break the cycle of disaster. As you probably know, there is recurring drought in Southern Africa. 2006 years, this year is the worst drought in, 16, in 20 years. It is affecting 4 million people. The loss of crops means not only that farmers grow hungry, but they lose their seeds too. And this is a huge threat for their livelihoods. In response, in Zimbabwe, 72 women-led farmer field schools have been established and seeds, seed banks have been, have been established to enable farmers to have access to seeds when they have to re-sow, they, they, they have to plant seeds one, twice, three times to be able to capture rainfall. We work with meteorological data and farmers' own data to be able to tailor-made agricultural planning. We work with wide-scale introduction and ad ad adaptation of diversity and policy engagement to support farmer seed system. Next, please. As I said, we also work in high potential area where we work with farmer seed enterprise. Um, in, uh, next, please. In, in Vietnam, for example. No, uh, next, please. Yes, in, in Vietnam. Um, about 19,000 farmers have been trained in farmer field schools and they train other farmers. Over 300 farmer varieties have been released. Our farmer field schools have established 400 seed clubs, and they provide 30% of the seed requirement of the Mekong Delta. The Mekong Delta is, as you probably know, the largest rice producing region in Vietnam. Vietnam is the second largest rice exporting country in the world. Our farmers provide 30% of the seeds requirement, and in fact, our farmers' seeds are bigger than the private sector, who only provide 18%. The quality of the seeds that the farmers produce are of high quality. They have received many awards. And this show overwhelming evidence for policy change in democratizing research and development and to enable farmers to engage in the market. Next, please. We're doing similar things in, in Peru. This is a picture of a seed bank and we also work with early warning system to develop knowledge and capacity to manage agricultural production and uh, related stresses. Um, next, please. Policy influencing pathway is very important. Most of the national seed policies and laws do not recognize and support, support farmer seed systems, and this really needs to change. Our program engages local to global policy influencing, not only based on evidence uh, policies, but based on real experiences of farmers in the, in the ground, and we provide models for multi-stakeholder engagement. 
Our ambition is to work towards a farmer's rights guidelines, particularly in policy and implementation. Um, I, I'd like to end by uh, show, to, to stress that, the, that initiatives such as the benefit sharing funds is really very important and it needs more support because it really works in terms of uh, supporting livelihoods, creating diversity, both for low and high potential areas. Thank you. Dr. Manikad, thank you very much for sharing Oxfam's work on supporting farmers and their sustainable livelihoods. And it's my great pleasure now to turn to Laurent Gabarel from the NGO Burn Declaration. Laurent is the program coordinator on agricultural biodiversity and intellectual property. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the treaty and FAO to invite me and I've been asked to talk about the link between um, farmers' rights and biodiversity, so I must first say that I'm not a farmer and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but my organization is uh, deeply involved in the, those discussions in the treaty and we're campaigning in, in the supporting uh, farmers' rights. So first, what are farmers' rights? I think you heard it, uh, there are four main components of farmers' rights. The first one is the right to save, use, exchange and sell farm safe seeds. The second one is the right to participate in decision making. The third is the right to participate in sharing benefits from the use of uh, genetic resource. And the fourth is the right to the protection of traditional knowledge. Those are the main components and the treaty makes it clear that this is not an exhaustive list. Then the link between farmers' rights and biodiversity is, again, quite clear from the presentation and, and from the treaty itself. Uh, the basis for farmer rights, for the recognition of farmer rights, is the, the past and the present contribution to biodiversity uh, of farmers. So you have, for example, in the preamble of the treaty, uh, this clearly stated, uh, and I quote, it's, it says, affirming the past, present, and future contribution of farmers in all regions of the world, um, particularly those in the centers of origin and diversity in conserving, improving, and making available these resources is the basis of farmers' rights. And it's also, you find a similar wording in Article 9 of the Treaty um, uh, on Farmers' Rights. So, of course, you can say that uh, we can now uh, preserve the existing biodiversity in gene banks uh, but the problem is that then you lose the ongoing and constant uh, adaptation uh, and evolution in the farmers' fields. Uh, and this is only possible if, you, if farmers have the right to save, use and exchange and sell farm-saved seeds. Or to put it another way, the right of farmers to seeds is the right of uh, humanity to biodiversity. Now, um, what are the threats to the farmers' rights? Because uh, we must say that uh, although recognized, the farmers' rights are still not a reality and there are a number of dangers. So I will not go in everything, but I have um, selected five more, uh, main threats to farmers' rights. So as the previous speaker said, um, still when developing PVP laws or seed laws or patent laws, in most countries there is still uh, an exclusive focus on the formal seed system and the farmer and the peasant seed system is not well taken into account nor acknowledged nor uh, supported by this law. Second, uh, now many developing countries are adopting or are in the, in the process of adopting um, PVP law based on UPOV 91 uh, and this is due mainly for, to the pressure of the industry and of developed countries. And the, the UPOV 91 model is, uh, is, was developed for the type of agriculture that we have in developed countries. Uh, but in developing countries, it's still uh, the access to seeds is still uh, mainly through the informal sector, through farmers themselves uh, producing seeds, exchanging seeds and selling seeds, the, those seeds in local markets. And what happened is that the UPOV 91 model put severe restriction on the rights of farmers to save, use, exchange and sell uh, farm-safe seed of protected varieties. 
Third, uh, the right to participation in decision making is still not a reality, you know? uh, as we've seen recently with some case where um, new PVP law were adopted or seed laws were adopted, farmers were simply excluded from the process. Uh, and even we have seen cases where constitutional courts have uh, then stopped the enactment of those laws on, on this basis, on the basis of the lack of participation. So this needs to, to be improved. A fourth, um, the current system of benefit sharing under the treaty is not working well. Uh, there has been so far no mandatory benefit sharing by the users of the multilateral system. Um, the member states are now working on this, but the outcome is still uh, unclear. And fifth, um, there is a new trends also, and new threats. One is the patenting of native threats, or native traits of the genetic resource accessed under the, the um, treaty, and also the dematerialization of genetic resource, meaning that soon, sooner or later, you will not uh, anymore need to access the, the genetic resource itself, the seed, but only the genetic information. And this information is increasingly being put in, in dat database, freely accessible around the world. So that is also a, a concern that needs to be addressed. And in fact, in the last uh, treaty body meeting, Via Campesina, which is the, the main uh, peasant movement around the world, made it clear that uh, unless those issues are addressed, they will no longer uh, share seeds with the treaty. So that's a concern. So now, to end up with a positive note, the way forward, uh, again, I have five uh, uh, proposals or um, pathway to, to improve and strengthen the farmers' rights. The first, as was mentioned, um, just now, a working group is meeting here in the Human Rights Council. It's the working group on the rights of peasants and other people working in rural areas. And they are discussing a declaration. Uh, and in the declaration, uh, there is a right to seeds that is proposed. And the right to seeds is uh, mainly retaking the four elements of the right of farmers uh, as in the treaty. And we believe that if uh, recognized in a, in a UN declaration, this will strengthen implementation of farmers' rights. Two, um, we believe that now the treaty and its members have to take the lead for a better implementation of uh, farmers' rights at the global level, and this could be done through a guidance document for the implementation of farmers' rights at the national or regional level. That would be a first step. Three, um, we need to look at sui generis plant variety protection model um, that protects in a balanced manner breeders' rights but also farmers' rights. Uh, this is what has not happening so far. So the new voluntary guide, guide for national seed policy formulation by the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture is a helpful tool. We've also, uh, with APREBES, Bern Declaration, and other NGOs, we've worked on uh, uh, such a sui generis system. Uh, there is a report that you can find uh, uh, here uh, in the room. It's called Plant Variety Protection in Developing Countries, where we try to show that you can both protect plant variety and breeders' rights, and at the same time protect farmers' rights. Um, Four, there is an opportunity now, uh, there is a process on interrelations between the treaty and UPOV and WIPO. Uh, and this is uh, an opportunity to clarify the, the, the tension, the con possible contradiction that exists between the treaty and UPOV and WIPO, but also to, to come with clear recommendation on, on, on the way forward and on, and on the on next steps. Again, we are involved in this process. There is a, a symposium in October in Geneva, and we have uh, issued a report which is called International Contradictions uh, on Farmers' Rights that you can find uh, here also at the entry of the room. Um, four, um, sorry, this is my, my last point now. Um, there is now a review of the multilateral, multilateral system uh, going on under the treaty, and this is an opportunity to address a number of issues. And the main focus here is uh, benefit sharing, how to improve, uh, increase user-based payments, uh, 
And there we see some promising uh, opportunities. Uh, we support uh, having uh, only um, one subscription model uh, as opposed to, to the multiple uh, option model that you have now. And we believe that this uh, would uh, increase benefit sharing uh, uh, to farmers. Um, this review of the MLS is also an opportunity to address two other issues that I have mentioned before, the patenting of native threats. This can be clarified that uh, when you access material from the, the treaty, you're not allowed to do that. And also the issue of uh, um, dematerialization of uh, genetic resource, uh, making clear that when you access information, genetic sequences of uh, the genetic resource, you need also to, to sign a material transfer agreement and, and share benefits of the use. So we'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Laurent Gabarel, thank you very much for outlining so clearly some of your concerns and also recommendations on the way forward. And indeed, I return to Dr. Batty, and I understand that you have launched a global consultation on farmers' rights. Uh, yes, thank you indeed. Um, we have been preparing, and I'm very pleased uh, today on the occasion of the International Day to launch uh, formally the uh, global survey on the implementation of uh, farmers' rights. And uh, we would just, um, in order to contextualize this for you and also uh, foreshadow for the coming months the, the next steps, uh, perhaps give you a, a quick overview. Uh, so farmers' rights, as you have already heard and as has been mentioned, uh, are an integral part of the treaty. It is uh, part three in Article 9. Um, this is based on the recognition in the treaty that farmers are the custodians and developers of crop genetic resources um, and that their rights are crucial to enabling them to maintain and conserve this diversity. And the treaty is the only public international law instrument, binding instrument, that actually uh, recognizes these rights. Then uh, the text of Article 9 is what you see here uh, in abbreviated form. It first, as I mentioned, recognizes the cont contribution of farmers as custodians and developers of crop genetic diversity. And uh, it then sets out a non-exhaustive list of rights that are included in the concept of farmers' rights. And those are first, the protection of traditional knowledge relevant to uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Second, to equitably participate in benefit sharing, uh, sharing of the benefits arising from the use of those resources. And third, to participate in national decision making uh, on matters related to conservation and use. And uh, finally, uh, at the end of the article, the treaty provides that nothing in this article is to be interpreted as limiting the rights that farmers have to save, use, exchange, and sell farm safe seed and propagating material. I should also highlight that all these provisions are entirely subject to national law and policy, and the treaty recognizes that every contracting party um, maintains and uh, the discretion to implement it according to their own uh, preferences and priorities. Most recently, in last year, the governing body of the treaty adopted Resolution 5, 2015 on the implementation of Article 9, and in this resolution it set out a range of activities that uh, are actually the context in which this survey is being undertaken. Uh, first, the governing body invited contracting parties and other relevant organizations uh, to engage uh, with uh, the treaty to gather information at national, regional and global levels for uh, exchanging views and experiences and best practices uh, on the implementation of farmers' rights. It also requested uh, to hold consultations on farmers' rights. Uh, those are regional consultations and there has been and is there continues to be a series of regional and uh, interregional uh, consultations, pre-consultations uh, that are being held. The second uh, work track is the electronic survey that we'll see in a moment. And the third uh, basically step is the global consultation uh, that will, will be held in late September 
as uh, our chairman, Dr. Sabran, already mentioned, in Indonesia and Bali, hosted by Indonesia and Norway. The, the purpose of these consultations is basically to take stock of national experiences um, that have been accumulated over time uh, with the implementation of farmers' rights and to derive lessons learned and best practices. Secondly, uh, there is the uh, objective to explore the development of guidance, uh, support and capacity building on implementation of farmers' rights about, uh, that is provided to contracting parties as well as uh, farmers themselves. Coming concretely to the electronic survey, uh, the uh, survey is based directly on the governing body resolution and the text of Article 9. Uh, it addresses the uh, various, the different, the four parts of Article 9 that I already mentioned uh, and thereby directly reflects the structure of the, of the um, provision. The, uh, the survey can be filled in online directly um, on the FAO and Treaty website. Uh, it can also be completed uh, in hard copy and hard copies of the survey uh, have been made available for you um, on the desks and outside. Uh, this is a, a, snap, a screenshot of some of the pages uh, on the online version. Uh, it provides both or it, it requests uh, the provision of experiences with the implementation of farmers' rights as well as um, the identification of needs and expectations on uh, the further work for implementation of Article 9. This is a uh, snapshot. And with this, um, the, the survey will eventually uh, conduct a needs identification as well as the identification of the experiences already gained um, that could be built upon in order to address those needs. And that's um, essentially uh, all I wanted to brief you on regarding the survey. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the briefing on the survey. And in fact, that concludes the first session on protecting farmers' livelihoods and farmers' rights. We now move on to the second session, expanding benefits, bringing non-monetary benefits to farmers. And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Shura Zefna Hashemi, who's the first secretary of the Permanent Mission of Austria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm from the Permanent Mission of Austria in Geneva. And uh, I would like firstly to um, apologize on behalf of Dr. Alois Leitwein, um, who could not make it uh, to today's meeting in Geneva, but he will join you tomorrow for the working meetings. And secondly, I would like to introduce uh, the, key, the video message that he has uh, prepared and that will be shown right away. Um, Austria would like to reiterate its support to the work of the FAO, and we are very grateful to be invited to this event. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Vienna. Excuse me that I am not able to attend your meeting in time in Geneva today. Thank for having the opportunity to give a short message by video to the audience. Biodiversity and agriculture is a key element for food security now and in the future. Climate change and population growth are challenges for food security and agriculture. Only breeding and new varieties will match these challenges. We have to use the biodiversity given. That means to use all genetic resources available sustainably to create new biodiversity and agriculture. That means we have to create new varieties which are better adapted to changing environmental and climatic conditions. Therefore, we have to protect our genetic resources. But we have to create new biodiversity in agriculture at the same time. I think that we managed this challenge in Austria very good within the last years. In 1970, in Austria, we had registrations for 350 plant varieties for agriculture. In 2015, we had already 1,200 registrations. Agricultural biodiversity saw more than tripled 
in 50 years. But it's important for farmers and regions that there's a fair sharing of benefits from the use of genetic resources conserved by them so far. It is well, as well important for farmers in all regions to have a fair access to new breeds and varieties, and as well to the knowledge behind. The treaty will have a crucial role in this process. I want to add some short information on the Austrian Agency for Health and Food Safety Argus. We are a government-owned agency and we fulfill several duties in the field of soil health, plant health, animal health, human health and food security. Regarding biodiversity, we have following responsibilities. We keep the Austrian gene bank, we are the national contact point for the plant treaty, we are responsible for plant health, seed health and seed certification, we are responsible for plant variety registration and plant variety protection, we are responsible for GMOs in agriculture, we work on information capacity building of farmers and we are also involved in international capacity building projects. A key issue in our work is research and technology transfer. In this sense, we are the national contact point of the platform for the co-development and transfer of technology of the plant treaty. We present the Austrian Consortium Bioscience Austria for the platform as well. In autumn, Argus will organize two events regarding sustainable use of biological diversity in Vienna at this premises. At the first and second of September, we will organize an international seminar on integrated rights management for genetic data and material in plant breeding. The issue of the seminar is intellectual property rights management and compliance provisions under the new access and benefit sharing regime for genetic resources, taking into account the UPOF system, the Nicoya protocol, and the provisions of the plant treaty. In October 2016, we will organize a whole week of meeting and events, including a meeting of the platform of the plant treaty and the ad hoc technical committee of the plant treaty. I hope to see you at one of these meetings in Vienna in our premises. Further information will be circulated. For today, I wish you a successful meeting. Thank you. And that prompted me to think that uh, if you didn't hear very clearly what was being said, that all of the videos are being posted on the website just to let you know that before I actually pass on to Dr. Dao Nguyen, who's the coordinator of biodiversity policy at WWF International on biodiversity conservation as a global challenge is the topic of the doctor's comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, th I would like to thank uh, FAO and the International Treaty uh, on Planned Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture for organizing this event. Um, um, very, I w when I uh, saw the invitation, I was surprised that, that you are also celebrating the, um, the International Day for Biodiversity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I said, I'm very uh, happy to join you today to celebrate the, the important day for biodiversity. And uh, I, I hope through all the speeches um, before me, you are all uh, aware of what biodiversity is um, and why it is important for our livelihoods. You know, from nobody wants to eat potatoes for the rest of your life. So uh, from there, we can say that um, um, agricultural diversity, uh, seeds diversity is very important, but also for, for WWF, uh, we are an NGO. Um, globally, we have um, about uh, over 100 offices in all over the world, especially um, the, the, the South and East countries. Uh, our mission is to stop the degradation of our planet's um, uh, natural environment and build a future in which uh, human 
um, humans live in harmony with nature. This is consistently with, uh, I think, the, the plant treaty, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, and to, in order for us as an NGO to achieve this mission, we focus on the two main areas. The first one is uh, conserving biodiversity. Um, and uh, the second one is to reduce um, humanity's ecological footprint, so our, our everyday consumption and use uh, of uh, natural resources. So I was asked to, to look at how the uh, how in biodiversity conservation right now, what are the global challenges? Um, so I, I uh, speak briefly on the high level. So as humans have changed the Earth's ecosystems more rapidly in the last 50 years than any other period in, in um, human history. These changes have uh, degraded almost two-thirds of the ecosystems on which we <coughs> depend on, from food to building materials and cause uh, irre irreversible loss to many habitats and species. We see a lot of uh, extinction in our time uh, of species. We are already using nearly 30% more natural resources than the Earth can reproduce and releasing far more to, um, CO2 into the atmosphere than the ecosystems can uh, immediately uh, absorb leading to degraded, uh, degraded, um, sorry, degraded ecosystems and dangerous uh, climate change. So the major challenges uh, for, for biodiversity conservation globally, we engage with, uh, with many countries and also uh, with the conventions uh, on biological diversity and other uh, treaties, uh, is um, the major lack of awareness of biodiversity you know, even in agriculture, you're still also talking about how to raise awareness and protect farmers' rights. And uh, biodiversity and its values and function uh, is fundamental. And lack of mainstreaming biodiversity in decision making in other sectoral plans and policies, so across uh, other sectors. Um, so I'm very glad to see in agri agriculture sector we are talking more and more about um, diversity. And we also lack a uh, political will and commitment beyond the short-term short political wins. Very, very, uh, um, and weak of governance, lack of policy coherence and synergy. So I'm very glad recently we talked a lot about synergies between the um, biodiversity-related conventions, how we can work together, and also synergies at the national level between ministries, you know, so that one don't step over the other's um, um, work. And uh, unsustainable production and market and consumption uh, patterns that we, we see right now is unbalanced. Um, for, for me, to, biodiversity and linkages to livelihoods, we, uh, we talk a lot about our work in the, in the developing, de developing countries. So many of our world's ecosystems and areas of high biodiversity value are actually under threat and they are also where home to rural communities and indigenous peoples um, whose livelihoods and cultures are closely interdependent with nature. I grew up actually in the, in the a national park of Vietnam in the, in, um, through the periods of hardships and poverty. I was born in the 70s and grew up in the 80s where Vietnam was struggling after the war. Um, and my garden was actually the jungle. I ate so many fruits in uh, the forest and grew up, and my family depended on that diversity to, for life. Um, my parents still actually live there, and uh, without any formal running water, they use the water from the streams, and they use their own, and uh, catching rainwater, and use uh, um, fire wood to, for fuel. And all the surrounding areas, uh, outside of the protected areas, are now degraded and so need a lot of more attention because it's overpopulated and overharvested. Uh, the When I grew up, I can see firsthand a growing human population combined with resource-intensive and wasteful consumption <laughs> and production patterns are putting unsustainable pressure on natural environment and the services that it provides. 
Loss of biodiversity and uh, environmental degrade, uh, degradation tend to affect the poorest communities uh, more directly because if uh, uh, we our village they don't have the the pure running water from the streams, they would not have any other sources of water. It's not provided yet by the government. So that would really increase their vulnerability. So um, to have successfully managed protected areas, uh, my family could uh, use the basic services like clean water and pollination and wild materials from the area and many indigenous people that I grew up with as well. Much of the success of our work depends on the degree of which conservation contributes not only to the maintenance of preservation of biodiversity and ecosystems, but also to equitable and sustainable development um, for the well-being of the women and men uh, that rely on them. Responsible trade and investments, uh, good environmental uh, governance are the key to ensure uh, the responsible management of natural capital upon which we all depend on. And this is why WWF is working to integrate social uh, equity into our programs of work in the field and in our policy at the national and regional and global level. At local level, in the fields, forests, streams, estuaries, seas, uh, with development and conservation workers, local community members and indigenous peoples, farmers, fishers, landowners and consumers, so we work with. For us, equity at, the lev uh, at this level has three phases. Recognitions of people's rights by decision makers. Inclusion of local voices in decision making processes and fair distribution of costs and benefits of conservation actions. At the international, WWF is working with, um, with and seeking support from governments, policy makers, business, industry leaders, bankers, donors, and more uh, stakeholders to work on these issues. So although uh, we, we talk about how much we have to work and, and how the uh, environmental is degrading and biodiversity loss and so on, but we still have a lot of chances to reverse for me, opportunities, and for WWF so far, opportunities for us would be the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020 and its IG targets to provide a global framework for all countries, other treaties as well, to work under this, um, and other stakeholders to contribute to, it, to the achievement and implementation. For us, implementation is really the key. We have a good plan, but without implementation, we will not achieve it. We uh, should work together um, and support implementation, especially at the national and sub-national <coughs> levels. Uh, for environmental sector, uh, we need to uh, work with other sectors to, to do the how and to walk the walk with, with each other. And uh, as Braulio mentioned uh, earlier, the COP, CBD COP13 in Mexico with the, ma with the theme of mainstreaming biodiversity, and they are trying to invite other sectors, agriculture, fisheries, forestry, and tourism to, to join forces to think of the way forward of main mainstreaming. And I think this is very important, FAO is leading in this. Um, and also using the decade of biodiversity, uh, the UN decade of biodiversity to really raise awareness and promoting uh, and communicate this much more uh, at all level. And we need to raise awareness every day, not just one day of the year. Um, for and uh, the lastly, the most important agenda for us, I think right now, uh, as an opportunity is a uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its set of Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, committed by all head of states last year in, this, uh, in uh, New York, is a framework for uh, delivering biodiversity mainstreaming. It's very important. This, if this agenda is achieved, it will leave no one behind. So uh, it is very uh, comprehensive package that what exactly what we need to, to deliver sustainable livelihoods for everyone. And the indicator development process for SDGs is also very important. I hope FAO and other treaties are also engaged directly. Um, and we should reach out to the, the process. 
um, and the environmental sector also need to drive um, this uh, mainstreaming agenda, mainstreaming biodiversity agenda into other sectors, plans, programs, po and policies, and drive change in policy reforms within and across sectors at the national, international level through this uh, 2030 agenda. So finally, for me, uh, my message would be really uh, is uh, implementation at all level. And um, uh, all ministries, all governments, and stakeholders should, should uh, take it as their job, not as someone else's job. And all sectors should do their part to cooperate with each other. Um, only through raising the profile of biodiversity agricultural biodiversity, seeds biodiversity, it's linked to our survival. Can we hope to change our consumption and destructive impacts on nature and its services? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing some of the risks and, of course, the opportunities for conserving biodiversity. And that concludes the second section. And I now move on to the third, which is towards a long-term program to address challenges, opportunities, and the potential of the treaty. And I am delighted to give the floor to Dr. Rika Oliveira, a senior technical specialist, natural resource management policy and technical advisory division of IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me to speak on behalf of IFAD and this event from the Secretariat's part. Um, I will uh, give a short presentation of what we are doing and more on base of that and then talk a little bit about what are the challenges but also the opportunities we see. So IFAD, um, our mandate is to support the smallholders farmers around the world in accessing knowledge services and other assets to overcome poverty. Um, and we work through governments and other partners. Uh, for the sustainable development goals, if you invest in agricultural growth, then you would be twice as efficient in reducing poverty than if you invest in any other sector. So that's a key point for us when we start. 2.5 billion people drive their livelihoods and their income from small farms, agriculture. Most of them are poor and half of them are undernourished. So this is our target group. So with that said, it's clear to reaching those five of the sustainable development goals that is closest to our work, um, uh, we need to work with smallholders access to assets and to resources. And one of them is the plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. So our priorities in our current strategic framework, but they go further back. Um, on the top you have that one of the things we are trying very hard to do is um, getting indigenous peoples effective involved and their participation in development. They are often marginalized. We try to pull them in when we do rural development and make them set their agenda for what development do they want. That's a very important point for us. Nutrition security, part of the mandate, we work a lot on that. Gender equality, risk mitigation through diversity for resilient livelihoods and then the climate change adaptation. For all these priorities that go cross-cutting effect work, um, the plant genetic resources, or the access to the plant genetic resources for smallholders is very, very important. So how do we do that in practice? Local seed systems, that's one way, and that's something we work quite a lot on with our government and other partners. And it's also been spoken on quite a lot today. <laughs> um, um, these systems are informal, but it's already been mentioned by other partners, the local seed banks and the building the capacity for seed multiplication, quality, how do you save the seeds, quality savings, so the local seed systems get strengthened. The other way to work on um, small farmers' access to plant and resources is the participatory variety selection and research. And we try to support that mainly through our grant program, but we also win 
the governments are following should we try to build it into our loans. So this is kind of the framework around what we are doing on plant and energy resources. Next. Um, okay, so the title disappeared there. Just, <laughs> this is one of our grant projects um, that specifically targeted uh, the neglected and underutilized crops. Um, and it's similar also to the work that, that Oxfarms told about. So it was a grant giving to Biodiversity International. The only difference from, from the program Oxfarm, Oxfarm presented is that this one works specifically on the neglected and underutilized crops and what are threatening those and why do we no, not want to lose them. From, first of all, the farmers' indigenous people's point of view, most of these crops are with the indigenous people and these are the people who are using them still and feeding them back into the broader farming system sometimes. They're very important for adaptation to climate change and they have very important characteristics for nutrition. So the policy part of that work went into the nutrition policies of the countries. Why do we not want to lose these um, varieties from a nutrition point of view and how can they play a very active role in improving nutrition among the rural poor uh, communities? So the policy work went to there and had quite some success in some of the participating countries. So another example, and this is actually from one of our loan projects. Um, this is a project in the northeast India, and it works with tribal people, 21 different tribal people um, or tribes. So also 21 different knowledge systems and way of governing their natural resources, which was, has been quite interesting. And most of the time when we work with partners, which are the farmers, the government, in this case the state government, we learn just as much as I think the farmers can get from our support. Um, what happened in these mountain areas, these are mountain areas and these are forest mountain areas, is that the forest was quite a lot under, under threat. Um, because of increase in population, but also because of unregulated use of, of extraction of the forest resources, and then the selling of communal forest land to, to farmers doing monoculture. So part of the work, this is a loan, so it's a 20 million investment running in two phases. The second phase was 20 million, I don't have to figure for the first phase. But part of the work was to look at the agrobiodiversity. So what can be revived? So you can see the women, the lady there, having a huge cabbage. That was one of the varieties that was found in some of the communities and then again spread out to, to the rest of communities. And one of the reasons that the farmers like to use this one is that it has these multiple benefits for, for feed for the livestock. And that's often what we see. The, the crops that have multiple benefits, these are the ones that are interesting for small farmers because it, it, it strengthens their diversity strategies in, in sustaining their livelihoods. The other part of the work was these seed markets, festivals around what they are specialized in. And they have so beautiful variety of chilies in this case. And working in that way around, and the farmers themselves are setting the, the agenda Slowly, their community organizations, their governance system got new life and got strengthened. So in the next slide, you will see the other thing the project works on is in the, they do this shifting farming. So um, because of the population increase and the other pressures of the forest areas, the cycle of their shift had become so short, so the forest couldn't recover every time. So sitting down with the tribal communities themselves and looking at that system, is there a way to optimize it? Not forbid it, but optimize it, because it is a, it's a very fundamental part of their culture. So what, what we figure out in the collaboration with the farmers and the extension workers uh, was that um, if you do two cycles instead of one when you do the, the shifting farmers, farming, you can again get a longer period between each shift. So the, there you can see in the photos on the left side, that's the first year crop. You have rice then cultivated, integrated with, 
with maize um, and also some millets. So this is again, they, in, in their thinking, they were thinking uh, diversity in the, in, the, in the field. So this is basically it's something that they already had. But then in the second cycle, instead of just moving on to a new forest area, you can actually cultivate one more time. And what they have there is the ginger intercrop with beans. And the ginger was an important part of this project because that's their cash crop. It increased their income. Um, so the reduction in the, they call it JUM, the, the shifting farming, the JUM areas, their, their farms, was actually 40 to 45 percent. So it's quite significant. If you work with them on how can you optimize the system, you can get really far down. Wildlife turned back, stream flows and rivers came back, and that in itself was very important for, for the tribal people because that's their biodiversity. So the next is, that is, that's also an example for one of our grand projects, but it's quite a remarkable example. Um, it's from Iran, where the Senesta is, a, is an, an NGO, it's called the Center for Sustainable Development. They were leading this, pro, this grand project, where they worked together with Ikara and Dasi, and also Iri, in putting together a packet of like 1,000 to 1,500 varieties of barley, wheat, and rice. And then you give that package out. It's a totally other way of thinking, breeding that in the conventional system, even though it's, it's, it's a very old system to do it this way, you give this package back to farmers because they live in these very marginalized systems um, where climate change is also kicking in and it's really difficult to do farming. And then you make the nature work together with you in your breeding, and that's actually what farmers have been doing for thousands of years. But you do it now in a systematic way, and we had the researchers in the centers helping putting these packets together. So you get a very interesting mix of plant genetic resources. You get a huge amount of genetic resources back into farmers' fields in one go. And the interesting thing was that already in the first year, these new mixed varieties turned out to be pretty good yielding. And when the droughts started to kick in, which comes once in a while, they were a lot better yielding. Like the local varieties that was left, and also the high yielding or the, the hybrid yielding varieties. So very significant results um, on doing breeding that way. So it's called um, evolutionary participatory plant breeding. Um, and so we, what, the knowledge coming out of this project is that it can work very well in marginalized um, uh, environments. Um, and it's a way to give farmers totally ownership of their future in terms of, of participating in breeding, but with the support and backup from the scientists, and in this case, from the multilateral system of, of seeds, because if we didn't have that system, we couldn't have put these packages together. So I think it nicely de demonstrates how all these pieces can fit together in giving farmers more access to plant genetic resources and also to share it. Um, this is just to show one of the very, at the edge of these communities where they actually managed to cultivate uh, barley in this case. So quite remarkable. Um, and to end, uh, challenges that we see, yes, we also see that there's a weak national implementation of the access and benefit sharing and farmers' rights. We are not there, there's a lot of work to be done, but we more work from below. Um, local seed systems, that is part of a lot of our, our loan projects. Um, and these heterogeneous population seeds that I just talked about from Iran, they do not fit into most of the seed laws in most of the countries um, and the certification systems. This has already been touched upon and they can't stand these, the tests that comes under the UPO for, for the VCU and the DUS, which is these, if I remember correctly, <laughs> the value for cultivation and use, so you have to show conformity, which is very useful if you have commercial seeds that you pay a high price for, that you really know that they also produce. And then you have the other one, which is distinctiveness, uniformity, and stability. Um, of course, doing plant breeding more based on, 
on diversity as such won't fit into these systems. It's simply two different worlds. You can't put them together in the same system. So, so these are the challenges. However, I think our work and also the work told by other colleagues here today shows that access and benefit sharing, it works at a local level. But it's not this kind of access and benefit sharing where there's the monetary compensation of farmers. But if you support farmers in their own systems, you get the benefits in by f with, with feeding back in genetic resources from the, the gene banks and also the research systems. You work together, then it can actually spread out and there's a huge uh, benefit sharing from the farmers' communities themselves. So there are things that work and it's also possible to do the work on the local seed systems even though the, the legal framework might not as such accept these systems. Very few countries will try to actually get rid of them because they do know how important they are for food security. So this is a good thing. But how do we bring it to more scale? Um, <coughs> The most difficult part is maybe the, the vertical upscaling throughout the systems, solving exactly that issue of how do we make legal policy frameworks that have this integrated view of a seed sector. We need both the conventional formal we have today, but we also need the other one. Um, how do we make a framework that can capture both so they can benefit each other? Um, and the other thing is the shift a little bit, not away from, but at least also have some priorities, a bit more focus at what is the research need of smallholder farmers, because they are not necessarily the same. Linking back to because the way they use diversity is so much more diff different because of their resilient strategies uh, that we should not interfere with. Um, and then there is the so, so we can work on those two sides. I think for the vertical, for, for the horizontal scaling out, um, I think it's about doing more of what has been told today. Uh, and us as a an, an financial institution, we are definitely working on it also because the, the, our country partners and definitely the farmers are asking for it. So, so that comes, but of course there's a lot to be done. Um, then one more challenge, support smallholders participation in food system through strengthening their farmers' organization. This is kind of the bread and butter of what we're doing. We need to make sure the smallholders are linked into our food systems as they change. And that can sometimes be a challenge. A lot of what we do in EFAT is work on value chains like so many other finance institutions and governments. When you work on value chains, there's this tendency that you get your work into a focus on one cash crop that can get these people uh, some income and of course the end goal is to lift people out of poverty but if you haven't taken into account um, that the smallholders live based on diversity they bumps back into poverty that's what we can see if the cash crop fails. Dr. Oliveira, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, um, I can sense your passion and enthusiasm. If you would just like to make one concluding remark, and then I feel that we must let uh, Sonia Chergo from the European Seeds Association. No, that was the last slide, thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, last but not least, um, Sonia Chergo, Director of IP and Legal Affairs of the European Seed Association, and I believe you're going to touch on the issue of innovation for sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, that's right. Um, first of all, I would like to um, say thank you to the Secretary of the International Treaty for uh, inviting us, or me, today um, to talk a little bit about what uh, the seed industry, or at least the European seed industry, is doing um, in terms of uh, voluntary benefit sharing and how do we uh, celebrate the International Day of uh, Biodiversity. So, um, first of all, um, I would like to say a few words uh, maybe about the organization because you might uh, not know all uh, what, who we are and what we do. We are a regional organization uh, representing the seed industry, at least 95% of the seed industry in Europe. And our main activity is to work on seed related legislation with the European institutions and with international uh, bodies as well, such as the International Treaty as well as the CBD. Um, 
In terms of the treaty, I just would like to say a few words about how the sector sees the treaty. We of course have the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol and the treaty. Um, and for the sector, the treaty is seen as a very important and the preferred tool when we talk about access and benefit sharing in relation to plant genetic resources. Um, not yet. <laughs> um, in terms of the goals, uh, how the sector would like to improve uh, the treaty and use the, uh, the uh, potential of the treaty, because that was also the title of the session, we would like to improve the treaty's coverage and its implementation. We would like to increase the treaty's income and we would like to improve the treaty's uh, multilateral system in terms of use, uh, using of its material. Uh, when it comes to celebrating the International Day of Biodiversity, this year we launched an online campaign, uh, which we gave the title Innovation for Sustainability. And uh, if you receive this presentation later on, if you click on the image, uh, you will be guided directly to the campaign that we have done uh, online. And if you want, you can also support the campaign. Um, the um, topic of the campaign is basically to show the voluntary benefit sharing activities of the sector in Europe. However, I also would like to underline that we have launched this activity in Europe. Nevertheless, we are now expanding it uh, to the global level together with the International Seed Federation. Um, what is this project all about? Uh, there are a lot of activities of in-kind or voluntary benefit sharing, as you want, uh, done by the seed industry, companies, individual companies all over the world, as well as national seed associations or regional associations such as us. And we wanted to gather all these projects in order to show how many of those are out there and to, make, uh, to present them in a way which basically shows um, all the stakeholders within this discussion that there is a lot which is already being done for a long time by uh, the industry. So if you go and visit our website, you can uh, have a look at this map. And all those leaflets represent uh, individual projects, sometimes multiple projects in, uh, in a number of countries. We basically have now a bit more than 60 projects on the website and I'm very confident that we are going to have a lot more if we can expand also to the global level. Um, we try to categorize these projects into several uh, categories and um, I would like to um, basically just show you a couple of um, those projects focusing on some specific areas. Nevertheless, I would also like to say that our activities we categorized into provision of advice in relation to genetic resource management, concrete involvement in genetic resource management with gene banks. It's mainly characterization and maintenance work where breeders contribute a lot to gene banks, providing material to the multilateral system uh, via national gene banks, direct financial support, um, either to the treaty or to different projects, sustainable use of genetic plant genetic resources, awareness raising about the importance of uh, plant genetic resources, technology transfer and capacity building. One of the projects which I wanted to show you um, is related to sharing knowledge and technology transfer and providing material to the multilateral system. Uh, it is a very nice public-private partnership, is a one more P there than it should be, in pre-breeding. And this covers, currently it covers three crops, spring barley, apples and perennial ryegrass. Nevertheless, it's a continuous project, so there might be uh, new crops added to it. And it really, uh, it really is a partnership between universities in, uh, in the Nordic countries, breeding companies and Norton. Uh, they share the budget, half-half, <clears throat> and the results which are generated by these pre-breeding projects, the pre-breeding lines are uh, shared among the partners, of course, and they are also provided to Norten, and they are made available under SMTA, so put into the multilateral system. Um, another area where I wanted to mention one uh, voluntary benefit sharing activity we have done is the direct financial support to the benefit sharing fund of the treaty, uh, very recently, we provided uh, 300,000 euros directly to the treaty uh, in order to support the benefit sharing fund. The next one, and then there are a number of projects in relation to capacity building, which I think are particularly interesting for uh, today's uh, meeting. 
which uh, I would like to show three of them, but I would really encourage those of you who are interested uh, to have a look at all of them because they are all very interesting and nice and it's very difficult to select only a few. One of them is in Indonesia, which is actually a project done by a leading seed company in uh, that area, East West Seeds. Um, and it's aimed at improving the uh, opportunities of vegetable growers in the lowlands in particular, where the conditions are particularly difficult. And so far, the project, uh, the project achievements are, uh, they have done some digging of wells in order to uh, install some pipelines to make more water available for irrigation as well as for consumption. Uh, they have provided manuals to vegetable growers on how to uh, on better vegetable cultivation techniques and they made those available to, to many farmers. And they have also done other activities like planting of trees to make the environment greener and nicer. Another one which I wanted to show you is in Ethiopia. There are, by the way, multiple projects in Ethiopia. This is called uh, Fair Planet, the project. And there are a number of partners to the projects, not only seed companies, but there are five leading vegetable seed companies who are partnering the project. Um, and the aim of the project is to improve farmers' livelihoods via training mainly. Uh, there have been already a number of uh, sub-projects completed and some nice achievements uh, which, can, which you can also visit on the website of the project. Uh, has been the facilitated access of smallholder farmers to seeds of very high quality vegetables um, which, uh, which are adapted to the needs of the farmers and of course providing material is one thing but it's also very important to provide knowledge to the farmers how to use those seeds. And in this project, it has been done in a way that uh, the, f the, the training is given to the farmers to use those high quality seeds with a minimum change or no change to their traditional practices. And the last one, please. And the last one I wanted to show you is also uh, a very innovative way of benefit sharing, I would say. It's a project with one potato company based in the Netherlands called AZPC, uh, working together with the International T Potato Center in Peru. Uh, and the idea is to implement benefit sharing with custodian farmers in Peru in a new way, I would say. Uh, their basic aim is to empower the farmers to organize themselves and to uh, achieve a better representation of themselves in decision making. And for that, the company I mentioned basically made available a startup fund to the farmers in order to do whatever they want with that fund and uh, the first um, amount of money they have already used for the purposes they wish to. So um, these were the projects I wanted to highlight, but as I said, there are a number of those, and I think it's very interesting to have a look. So if you have time, if you're interested, I would encourage all of you to, uh, to have a look. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, and thank you for all of the distinguished panelists for sharing their enthusiasm and passion today about conserving biodiversity and benefit sharing. I would like to ask the audience if there's anybody who would like to make a remark, a comment, and indeed I can see the lady from Ecuador, please um, say who you would like to answer your question or the comment that you would want to make followed by this gentleman in front of me and the lady at the back. Thank you very much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have, uh, I'm seeing in familiar faces. Uh, I must confess I had a, a long speech prepared because Ecuador has been very much involved in the treaty we, and uh, so <laughs> we have uh, worked together and, uh, but uh, since uh, Time is so short. I want to just to uh, take, pay tribute to the treaty, to Dr. Bati, and the work we have done in uh, 2013. Myself, I, I was organizing the first uh, national farmers' right con um, uh, consultation after we had the first regional farmers' rights consultation, and that was the, the, the foundation for the, um, the resolution adopted at the um, fifth uh, governing body in, uh, in actually in, 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 uh, in uh, no, in um, Oman. Yeah. So, uh, long story short, 
we are very much committed. Uh, very good news, Ecuador is uh, on those bases now uh, preparing a new legislation on biodiversity and we managed to include their farmer rights. Uh, let me, that one I want to say it as it is because it's been a long process of consultation trying to um, ensure the um, well we're talking about the uh, farmers on decision making and um, so <coughs> it's already in the in the project so it's uh, the we have this uh, um, seeds agro-tourism, agro-biodiversity, sustainable use. Ecuador is also part of the, of the ad hoc uh, committee of sustainable use of the treaty. Uh, so, um, and uh, th the idea is to have uh, finalized the law uh, before the end of the year. So we are very much looking forward and uh, this is a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I'd now like to give the floor to the gentleman from Indonesia. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Uh, we also would like to join uh, uh, other uh, in congratulating uh, you and also the speakers uh, for the uh, these uh, presentations uh, provided for us. Uh, we have so many questions and also comments, but uh, for the sake of time, we only have two questions, different question. One question will be to Mr. Sakil Bati and also to Mr. Lorong Gabriel. And the second question to Ms. Sonia Koskur. Uh, sorry if I, I, I'm not uh, uh, well pronounced the, uh, the name. Uh, first question is about the uh, harmonization or relationship between UPOF, uh, FAO, ITP, GPR, FA, and also the uh, WIPO. Well, actually, I'm in charge for the issue of the negotiation in IP in WIPO. But as Mr. Sakil, Bakil, uh, Sakil I think you, you were there in the negotiation of uh, in WIPO. We discussed about attacks uh, of genetic resources, and it is mentioned about ITP, GPR, FA in the text. Uh, my question to also to Mr. Sakibati and also to Mr. Lorong is, uh, do you think that the discussion of ITPGPR should be included in the text or it's not should be there? In other words, it, let it be discussed in FAO or it should be discussed also in WIPO. Uh, if perhaps we'll take those two questions first and then we'll move on to Sonia okay, Chiago, whose name is very difficult to pronounce, but then thank you. very few of us can actually master Hungarian. Um, your question to uh, Dr. Barty and to Laurent Gabriel. Yes. Yes, thank you, and thank you very much um, uh, for your question regarding the the various processes in which the yeah. international treaty is referenced. Indeed, you were referring to two processes um, where there are currently references. One is in the WIPO Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property, Genetic Resources, mm -hmm. and uh, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore. And in that draft text, uh, there are indeed, uh, yes, several references. And those references actually build upon a long, I would say, history or tradition almost of uh, incorporating the treaty and the multilateral system of the treaty within the intellectual property related uh, frameworks that pertain to um, to in particular uh, patents and, and genetic resources. And there have been in the discussions on disclosure requirements uh, in patent applications uh, for inventions that utilize genetic resources, there have been repeatedly proposals such as the Swiss proposal, which have indicated that if, if countries so decide to incorporate uh, such a disclosure requirement into existing patent frameworks, then it would be appropriate to indicate in case of genetic resources received from the multilateral system of the treaty and then utilized in the claimed invention that's claimed in the patent application, that in that case it would be relevant to refer to the multilateral system as the source of the genetic material, not necessarily 
um, as it is in other versions of the text is the country of origin. So from a purely technical point of view, uh, that would presumably be consistent and make sense, but I would really like to stress first and foremost that this is a matter for the countries to decide. Thank you. Laurent Garabel. No, and, and briefly also, I think it's the mandate of the, the group, Genetic Resource, and that's the discussion now in Europe with the implementation of Nagoya also. Um, how do you ensure that uh, your benefit sharing and prior informed consent has happened? So I think now if you access under the uh, MLS uh, system, you're fine. And otherwise, you have also to show your uh, uh, Nagoya compliance. And in, in this context, checkpoints are very important. <laughs> and uh, the disclosure of uh, requirements could be one. And, and would be very important, uh, uh, but uh, um, in Europe, that's not the checkpoints now for the for for the CVDs when the product uh, enter the market. Uh, and now they are in Europe in the process of uh, discussing guidance for uh, plant uh, plant genetic resource. Maybe Sonia, you know more than me about that. But for sure, we su would support a lot uh, having a disclosure requirement for uh, to to check, no, to control compliance. And so your question to Sonia? Yes. Uh, thank you, Laurent, and also uh, Sika Sakil. I think the explanation is going to uh, the next question for me to the uh, our colleague from European Union uh, Association. Uh, in, in your practice, in your uh, daily life, do you think that the CETA uh, Association or companies uh, could go along with this uh, proposal? How would you see the challenge? And as it has been also stated by uh, our colleague, that the European Union is now trying to uh, uh, conclude a certain arrangement. So how, how do you think from the business perspective? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's an interesting one. Um, of course, we are, we are working um, a lot together. I myself, I don't follow or I haven't followed so far uh, um, the IGC negotiations. Although we are now becoming observers to, to, uh, to the IGC, uh, uh, we have a lack of resources, so to say, anyway. Uh, so um, we do have a position on, uh, on the famous issue of disclosure of origin. And uh, we, we can accept um, uh, a provision on disclosure. Nevertheless, we, uh, we prefer to talk about disclosure of source, because in terms of uh, plant breeding, your source is always known. You know where you, where your direct, what your direct source is, where you get the material from. Nevertheless, uh, if we talk about origin, it is very difficult to know what the origin is in certain cases. And the question is, how long do you have to trace back? And that can make it very, very difficult. And in some cases, bridges just don't know what the, the origin of a certain material might be that they, they have since a long, long time. That's why we prefer um, to refer to source, disclosure of source, and that we can accept. Um, in terms of the, uh, the discussions within the EU, uh, concerning, of course, uh, I guess you all know that the EU has um, enacted a, a regulation in order to implement the compliance pillar of the Nagoya Protocol in EU law. And uh, the regulation has been adopted in 2014, an implementing regulation has been adopted in 2015, and now they are still working on guidance because um, yeah, the regulation has a number of provisions which are quite vague and there is need for guidance for the users to, to, to really know how to comply with the rules of the regulation. And indeed there are a number of sectoral guidance being prepared one on plant breeding in particular, and we are working uh, heavily together with the, with the Commission in order to find a way to, uh, to make sure that we comply with the provisions, because um, there is absolutely a willingness within the sector to comply with the new obligations. Um, but it's, we need to find a way which is pragmatic, because in some occasions plant breeding is a bit different than other sectors uh, using genetic resources, and uh, we would like um, to find a way which takes into account also the fact that we have another instrument, which is the treaty, um, and we use that instrument, and we prefer to use that instrument in any case. Thank you, and I'd like to take a question or a remark from the lady at the end who perhaps would like to say her name and her title. 
Yes, um, good afternoon. My name is Usana from the Thai Permanent Mission to the WTO and WIPO. And I would like to thank um, the FAO and International Treaty for organizing this event. Uh, it's been really uh, informative and, and very enlightening for, for the two of us here. Um, I also have a question for Mr. Gabriel from, from the Bern Convention. Um, you mentioned about the interrelation between um, UPOF 1991 and the um, International Treaty and, and WIPO. Um, from your experiences, how can the member of the UPOF 1991 and the International Treaty fulfill their um, obligations under these two um, instruments, uh, particularly in uh, protecting the British right under Article 14 and 15 of UPOF and the uh, protection of the rights of farmer under Article 9 of the International Treaty. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, for me, the answer is quite simple. It's impossible. Um, if you're under UPA of 91, you have some flexibility uh, regarding uh, farmers' rights uh, to save and reuse on their own uh, holding. Uh, the farm safe seeds, that's true, but it's very, very limited. Uh, it's only for private purpose, non-commercial, so it's really for uh, small-scale farmers uh, producing food to feed themselves, and including there, you might be subject to the payment of uh, royalty. Uh, so we're not even talking about exchange seeds, it's totally uh, excluded, and sell uh, selling seed is also excluded under uh, UPOV 91, so it's very difficult to see uh, uh, how you can uh, be um, both UPOV 91 compliant and implement uh, farmers' rights. Uh, but it should be also recalled that under TRIPS, uh, you've absolutely no obligation to implement UPOV 91. TRIPS, what it says is that you should provide protection for plant variety through uh, a patent or through a sui generis system. Uh, and UPOV 91 is one system, but there are other systems. Um, and also we could recall that UPOV uh, in its uh, past version uh, was only prohibiting the selling of uh, uh, farm-saved seeds, not the exchange of, of seeds. So that's already a, a step in, in the, the, the right direction. But we have also other sui generis systems that some countries have implemented. And the report that we've issued is uh, inspired of uh, those uh, experience of those countries that have implemented sui generis systems that both protect farmer rights but also offer a protection to, to plant variety and plant breeders rights. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent. And would anybody else like to make a comment or a question? Anybody from WIPO, WTO, who've been mentioned, UPOF? Well then, do I see somebody? I'm sorry, you're behind the camera, so um, please do uh, give us your name and title and uh, who your question is for. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for the, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Yolanda Huerta, I'm legal counsel at UPOF and I'm here with my colleague uh, Jung Koide, technical officer also in the UPOF secretariat. I would like just to maybe answer to the question from the uh, delegation from Thailand, just to refer that there are many UPOF members that are also contracting parties to the international treaty, and the majority of UPOF members are bound by the uh, 1991 Act of the UPOF Convention. Actually, from the 74 members, they cover the territory of 93 uh, states, and they are 50, I would say, contracting parties to the 91 Act, and the majority of them also are parties to the International Treaty. So I would say this is a matter for the contracting parties because the, I think the treaty refers to subject to national legislation, and I think there are different activities that are programmed in order to have a more closer dialogue to understand how those two treaties could be implemented and are being implemented in a mutually supportive manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. And anybody else would like to catch my eye? 
In that case, I'm delighted uh, to say thank you, everybody, for your contributions uh, to the discussion today. And uh, Dr. Barty, as uh, I walked into the UN with him, told me that he'd had very good news that there were no longer 139 contracting parties to the treaty, but as of yesterday, 140. Yes, thank you indeed, and indeed I'm very pleased um, to inform you that as of yesterday, um, uh, Argentina has been the 140th contracting party uh, of the treaty that has deposited its instrument of ratification. So we will be shortly publishing that um, later this week. So thank you very much, and I'm sure you're also looking forward to, uh, to the 22nd of May, which has been mentioned many times here, the UN International Day for Biological Diversity. But thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>